Hello and welcome to our freedom class. Thank you for watching online. Our first class, we're going to deal with two things, freedom in the Bible. We're going to be looking at the theme of freedom in a general sort of introductory way. And then secondly, we're going to look at freedom through repentance. But first, freedom in general. Freedom, by definition, because you got to define your terms, is the state of not being imprisoned or enslaved, right? You can become a captive or you can be free. And so uh, from the thesaurus, uh, freedom means liberation, release, emancipation, deliverance. This is a huge theme in Scripture. And the main verse, sort of the theme verse for the whole freedom course is John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Isn't that great? If the Son, if Jesus sets you free, you will be free indeed. So we're free as believers in Jesus Christ. But one thing we need to realize is that our freedom, though free to us, wasn't free to God. It cost him the very life of his one and only son. Our freedom is all about the gift of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 7, God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. So once again, though our freedom is free to us, something that we receive through faith in Jesus Christ, ultimately it wasn't free. It cost the Father his Son. It cost the Son his very life. But we celebrate the amazing freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. So what are we free from? Through faith in Christ, we are free from. And so I'm talking about those who are in Christ, those who have repented of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ and are following him as their Lord, those who have a relationship with Jesus, right? We're not talking about everyone. We're talking about believers. We're talking about disciples of Jesus. They are free from God's wrath, God's anger, God's just anger against sin. Romans 8 verse 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God doesn't condemn us. We're no longer accused before him. Instead, we are fully forgiven. We talk about the great exchange and it's found in 2 Corinthians 5:21. God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, of course, is the righteousness of God. Jesus is God's son. He's fully righteous, fully perfect, never sinned. But God took our sin, which we are full of, our rebellion against God, our, the actual sins that we have committed, and he placed them on Jesus and then punished Jesus in our place. And after Jesus' death, God then gives us Jesus' righteousness. So he takes what is ours and puts it on Jesus, and he takes what is Jesus and puts it on us. That is the great exchange. <laughs> it's amazing. That's the good news. That's the heart of the gospel. And so once again, our freedom isn't free. It cost Jesus everything. But now, notice, we are the righteousness of God. We might become. It's who we are. Just as Jesus was righteous and we were sinners, Jesus became a sinner, though he had never sinned, so that we could become the righteousness of God. So first of all, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are free from God's wrath. We are also free from sin. Look at this, Romans 6, 6 to 7. Paul says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, Christ, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, 
that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin because of a relationship with Jesus Christ, because we have been crucified with Christ. We have been set free from sin. Now, technically, we're free from sin, but we're also free to sin. We're, we're kind of back to where Adam and Eve were. This is St. Augustine's graph. I've used it before, but St. Augustine talks about Adam and Eve. They were actually able to sin and able not to sin. They had the free choice. Right? God could have made them not able to sin, but then they wouldn't have been human. They wouldn't have been made in his image. But when he gave them free choice, they were able to sin, able not to sin. Okay? And then after they sin, the old me, the me in Adam, the sinful me, was able to sin, but not able not to sin. It's not that I was as bad as I ever could be, but, but I didn't have the power to overcome the self, that rebellion against God. But now that I am a new person, a new me in Christ, I'm no longer in Adam, I am in Christ I'm the new man, a new creation. Now I'm able to sin and able not to sin. Notice it's like Adam and Eve all over again. I, I, my choice has been freed. And the problem is I am able to sin. But then the glorified me, when Jesus Christ returns, we get a resurrected body, we become just like him, then I'm able not to sin and not able to sin. You know, we come into this place of total freedom. But now we are genuinely free. Free from sin, but also free to sin. And we'll pick up on that later. So we're free from God's wrath. We're free from sin. We're also free from the law. Once again, Paul. Romans is, is all about freedom, and, and so is Galatians, but so, so much in Romans. Romans 7, verse 6. But now, by dying to what bound us, once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We, we have been set free from the law. We're no longer serving in the old way by the law. We're serving in a new way by the Spirit. Now, what does that freedom from the law looks like? Well, first of all, we are free from the curse of the law because God's wrath was on Jesus and not us. That's what that great exchange was about. So Jesus took the curse of the law, curse against sinners, God's wrath. Secondly, we've been freed from the law as a means of being right or righteous with God. Right? It's Jesus' obedience that saves us and not our own. Um, the law says you obey, you know, and obey perfectly. And God's grace says, well, Jesus obeyed and perfectly. And you can receive that through faith in him. So from that aspect of the law, we have been set free. We're also free from the law of obeying it in our own strength, which we can never do. Now we obey through the Holy Spirit. Spirit. He's the one who writes the law on our hearts and moves us to obey. That, that was an Old Testament prophecy of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit will write the law on your hearts and move you from within to obey. Listen to Romans 8, 1 through 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, we couldn't do it in our own strength, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in Jesus. That's the great exchange. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we come full circle. We couldn't keep the law, but Jesus did. And he died in our place, removing God's wrath and the need to, to keep the law as a way to be righteous. But then he writes that law on our hearts and gives us the Holy Spirit so that we, in effect, will keep the law, but not in our flesh, not in our own strength, but by 
the Spirit. It's, it's wonderful. And so we've been set free from God's wrath, from sin, the law. We've been set free from lies. John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you will really be my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth. <laughs> you, you will know what's truth. You will know what's lies and you will be set free. There are so many lies that we have believed, lies that, that, that the world has taught us, lies that our family has taught us, that our society has taught us, lies that Satan has whispered into our, uh, into our ears. But Jesus gives us the truth, and the truth sets us free. And finally, through faith in Christ, we are free from Satan. Colossians 1, 13-14 for he, Christ, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. So I'm going to start that again. It's actually, for he, God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. So that's Jesus. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Do you know that when we were in Adam, we were also part of Satan's kingdom? the domain of darkness. But when we believed in Jesus Christ, he, he translated us, transferred us from the kingdom of darkness and gave us a new citizenship in, in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Son he loves. And that happened through the redemption, that is, our ransom, forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins. Praise God. Look at what we are free from. God's wrath, sin, the law, lies, and Satan. Isn't that amazing? And so once again, our theme verse, John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Well, folks, this is our status. If we are free from all this, then why do we even need a course on freedom? <laughs> I guess I could just teach this first part and say, Amen, go home, you're free. Well, because though this is our status, it's not always our experience, right? Neil Anderson, who, who does a lot of work in the area of freedom, uh, has written many books. Uh, I'm looking in my library right now. The Bondage Breaker, um, I got one here called God's Power at Work, um, Victory Over the Darkness. He's done a lot of great work in what it means to be free in Christ. He estimates that only 15% of Bible-believing Christians are living free, productive lives. 15%. Um, that's anecdotal. I don't think he actually did any uh, hard survey on that, but that's probably true. Only 15%, 15% are truly free. Why is that? Well, our status, we're free. We, we are righteous in Christ. Our calling then is to become what we already are in Christ, righteous, <laughs> free. And our experience, of course, is that we are a work in progress. We are saved, yes, but we are also being saved. We are a work in in progress. And that process finally will be done when we get to glory and we are just like Christ. We, uh, you know, have a new body and, and a new heaven and a new earth and we will be completely free, completely saved. But we are saved. We're righteous. We're free. Our calling is to become what we are righteous, to walk out that freedom and our experiences that, hey, we're a work in progress, and sometimes we go forward, sometimes we go backward. And this class is all about moving forward in maturity, in freedom, in righteousness. So, though we are free, here's the point. We can enslave ourselves again to not God's wrath. Praise God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The great exchange has happened. We are are the righteousness of Christ. He has taken our sin away and we are that righteousness already. But we can enslave ourselves again to sin, 
the law, it's called legalism, lies, and Satan. We're free from those things, but notice, we can enslave ourselves to those things again. Paul, Galatians 5.13, the great apostle of freedom. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free because you are free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful flesh. Remember Adam and Eve? <laughs> they were free. They were perfect, but they chose sin. You, you are free. You, you, know, you, you are like Adam and Eve again, but you can choose to indulge the flesh. You, you can choose sin. That's how free you are. That's how free you are. God has given you freedom to actually choose to sin. Romans 6, 11 through 12. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. I'm dead to sin. I'm free from it. I'm alive in God. And therefore, I am not to let sin reign. Romans 6, 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. And who is he writing to? He's writing to Christians here. He says, you can walk right back into slavery by who or what you obey. If you obey slave, a sin, excuse me, you'll become a slave of sin. If you obey God, you'll become a, a slave of righteousness and, and obedience, which leads to life. Here's Paul on sin. Though sin remains as a foreign power within our lives. And I say that because in Romans 7, Paul says, you know, I sin, but it's really not me. It's sin in me. It, it, it's like a foreign power. I've been set free from sin. That's Romans uh, 5 and 6. But when he gets to sin, he said, I'm still struggling with sin. Romans 7, I'm still struggling with sin. It, but I've been set free. What is it? It's a foreign power within me. Okay, though sin remains as a foreign power within our lives, sin doesn't need to reign over our lives. We can follow the Lordship of Jesus. We are genuinely free, not fully free as we will be in glory. Once again, that's where freedom will be completely, completely uh, granted to us. So we can enslave ourselves again to sin. We can also enslave ourselves back to the law. Galatians 5, 1 through 2. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What yoke? Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. If you go back to the Old Testament law of needing to be circumcised to be part of salvation, then you are, might as, you know, then, then you're not trusting in Christ alone. You, you're, you're trusting in something else plus Christ, circumcision, uh, prayer, uh, going to church, whatever it is. If you're going to trust that plus Christ, it's like trusting in that alone. It's not Christ. That's called legalism. Remember, we're free from the law. The curse of the law, God's wrath was placed on Jesus, not us. We're free as a means of being made right with God. Jesus' obedience saves us, not ours. As I say, obedience saves us. It's, praise God, it's not ours, it's His. But now, we don't obey the law in our own strength. We obey it through the Spirit. So we don't go back to the law as a way of being made right with God. Don't go back to the law. We go to the law to find out what, what, who God is and, and what righteousness looks like. Right? That, that's there. But, but not as a means of, of obeying and getting right with God. It couldn't save us. It can't improve us. Colossians 2.8. We also can become slaves of lies. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. We can become slaves to lies, to false teaching, to false theology to non-biblical 
Gospels. We can become captives of these things. And we can become captive, enslaved by Satan. Ephesians 4, 26-27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. When we refuse to forgive people, when we live in bitterness, we open a window or, or a door in which Satan can get his toe in and then get a foothold into our life and from there influence our lives. Can't take away our salvation, but he can bring a certain amount of, of slavery, uh, bondage, even over the life of a Christian, something that we opened the door to. So once again, through faith in Christ, we are free from God's wrath, sin, the law, lies, and Satan. But though we are free, we can enslave ourselves again through our choices, through our actions, not to God's wrath, praise God, but to sin, to the law, legalism, to lies, uh, lies about ourselves, lies about God, lies about what's important, lies about what, what priorities are, lies about what makes life meaningful all the time, and to Satan. Well, how, how do we find ourselves enslaved again? Like, how, how can that happen if we're free? Well, through deception. We believe lies from Satan, from our world, from our families. Distraction. We're, we're distracted by the world, by the treasures of the world, you know, by the trinkets, about priorities, disobedience. We simply disobey, willfully disobey and find ourselves in slavery and laziness. <laughs> we're, we're simply lazy. You know, freedom must be maintained. Uh, freedom must be, must be remembered and, and, and celebrated. 2 Timothy 2 22. We memorize this as a church. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue. Those are strong words. Flee and pursue. There's no laziness here. You know, lazy Christianity, passive Christianity, lackadaisical Christianity is killing us. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But flee sin and pursue righteousness. So there's a lot of half-free Christians. Their status is free, but their experience is far from free because they've walked back into slavery. What are they like? Well, they lack boldness in prayer, in witness, and warfare. They, they, so to speak, their, their sword is, is dull, and they don't feel like they, they can really go for it. Go for it with God. Go for it by telling others about Jesus in warfare, they, they're, just, they're unsure, they're not free. They inappropriately feel God's condemnation. There is no condemnation, but they inappropriately feel that, oh, God hates me, he's judging me. Well, no, he loves you. And to be honest, there's nothing you can do to make him love you less, and there's nothing you can do to make him love him more. He loves you in Christ. That There's no condemnation. But, but, but Satan can whisper into your 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 ear and your spirit, and you can feel condemned by God. We appropriately feel the Spirit's conviction. Oh, He's convicting us. Our conscience, He's written the law in our hearts. He's speaking to us. That's wrong. But conviction and condemnation are two totally different things, right? Condemnation pushes us down. Conviction calls us forward and to God. Half-free Christians come under sin and Satan's oppression. It's an oppressive thing. They're, they're free, but they're oppressed. They come under God's loving discipline. That's good. He, he disciplines those whom he loves. And here's the good news. They can grow in their experience of their freedom in Christ. And that's what this course is all about. Half-free Christians, their salvation is not at stake. They are saved. But their freedom, victory, and maturity are at stake. They are saved... <laughs> And they are supposed to be being saved in the sense of growing in freedom, victory, maturity, and righteousness. But that, they're struggling in that area. And so that brings us to this class. Four classes. That was all introduction. You made it through. Four classes. Repent 
repent of a sin, forgive, forgive a person, believe, overcome a lie, resist, deal with a demon. Here are four places where people commonly um, are not free and where they can find great freedom in Christ quite quickly if they deal with these things. Now, notice I said repent of a sin, forgive a person, overcome a lie, deal with a demon. We're, we're not going to we're not going to cut so core of the onion that we're going to deal with all of it. I mean, that's impossible. And quite frankly, God often doesn't do that. He does one layer at a time. But if we learn how to repent of a sin, forgive a person, overcome a lie, deal with a demon, we have learned how to do it. And then we can take the next sin and the next sin, and forgive the next person, and deal with the next lie, and deal with the spiritual oppression, the next one. We've learned how to do it. We've tasted the freedom. We know the mechanism. We have a, a, a person we can walk with. And so we're not going to deal with it all, but we're going to deal with a sin, a person, a lie, and a demon. So today, we're focusing on repenting, repenting. Let's define our terms again. Repent. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is sub. It means to turn or to return. To turn from sin, to turn from idolatry, and to return to God. In the New Testament, the Greek, it is metanoia, and it literally means to change your mind. And so the concept with repentance... It's not just saying you're sorry, that's kind of part of it, but it's actually changing the direction you're going. You're heading towards sin and you literally stop and do a 180 degree and you head toward God, toward righteousness. You're, you're, it's an about face. It's, it's a U-turn. That's what repentance is. It means a radical change. Now, in the Christian life, there is the initial repentance. I would call that the big R, repentance. And that's when you see that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, and you see that Jesus died for you on, your, on the cross for your sins, and you cry out and you say, I am a sinner. And, and my sins nailed Jesus to the cross. He died for me. And, and, and I believe in him and I repent of that sin and, and I turn to Jesus. That is the initial repentance. That's where it all begins. But then there is the ongoing repentance after that initial conversion repentance. And if the first repentance is a capital R repentance, the second repentance, the ongoing repentance is a small r repentance. And, and that's dealing with, you know, the stuff that comes along, the ensnarements, the enslavements that come along the way. Look at uh, Luke 11, 3 through 4, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Give us each day our daily bread. So obviously you're supposed to pray that every day. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Don't you get the idea that the Lord's Prayer is to be prayed maybe daily or repeatedly? You know, forgive us our sins. That's not the big repentance uh, uh, uh sin or of, you know, prayer, although it could be, that's the daily prayer, you know, where we've sinned and we, we haven't forgiven somebody and we're dealing with something. Um, so there, I know there are some Christians and churches who say you, you repent one and you never repent again. I don't get that. <laughs> I, uh, I think repentance is awesome and I encourage it daily. Because that's what the Lord's Prayer suggests. Martin Luther, father of the Reformation, the very first of the 95 theses that were nailed to the cathedral door in Wittenberg, Germany. This is what got the Reformation started. The very first thesis says this. When our Lord and Master Jesus said, repent, he intended the entire life of believers should be repentance. Not just once, but the whole thing. The whole thing is a turning from sin and a turning to God each and every day. Yes, there is that initial one that saves you. But then there is that daily, moment by moment, repentance where I turn from sin 
and I turn toward God. So that really deals with our status. Once again, our status is righteous in Christ. We are forgiven. We have been given his righteousness. Our calling to become what we already are in Christ, righteous and free and mature. And then our experience, we are a work in progress. We are saved and being saved. And here's sort of the theme verse now for the second part of this class on repentance. This has it all. Revelation 3.19. God says, those whom I love, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And my friends, that was written to Christians. That was written to a church. He says, those whom I love, those who love me, I rebuke and discipline because I'm a good, good father. So be earnest, wake up and repent, change. So let's talk about repentance, but let's talk about what repentance is not. First of all, repentance is not this. God is good. You are bad. Try harder. <laughs> That's what I thought it was as a kid, right? Even as a Christian, you know, I, 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 I got to try harder. Uh, that, that's my problem. I'm not trying hard enough. And the harder I tried, the, the harder I fell. It, 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 it's not me. I, I, have you ever, you know, God is good. You are bad. Try harder. How, how's that working for you? Or promises, penance, and performance. Promises. I'll never sin again. I'll never do it. I'll never do it. And then you end up doing penance. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, penance is, you know, I know it's kind of a Catholic thing, right? But it's like, okay, pray this many prayers, give this much money, uh, help this little old lady across the street, walk up these many stairs, um, do this, do that. In, in other words, kind of prove to God that you mean business and do these things to, to, as a means of repentance. No, no, no. You know, repentance is the exact opposite of penance. Penance says, I can do this to, to, to make myself right with God, right? And repentance says, I can't make myself right with God. I, I've tried it. I, I fail every time. I am just simply going to come and say, I'm a sinner. I'm done with trying harder. I'm done with trying to keep the law, whether it's, it's the law, like the Ten Commandments, or man-made laws, like, uh, you know, give this much money or whatever. I'm done with that. That doesn't work because it's not repentance and it doesn't change us. And then, of course, performance. I'll show you, Lord. I'll prove that I was worthy of, of your forgiveness. I'll show you that I can be your son, your daughter. Like, like how's that going for you? That is not repentance. And then, of course, doing it all on your own because you're pri proud and you don't want other people to know it. And so you do it all on your own. And of course, that doesn't help. You see, how not to repent? According to the flesh. All of that stuff is according to the flesh. Promises, penance, performance, trying harder. That's me saying, look at me. I can do this. And when I do it, I did it. I get the credit. No, no, no. That, it's no longer the flesh. We are done with the flesh because that's exactly what brought us to where we are. We are going to rely only on the Spirit. I couldn't keep the law in my flesh, in my own strength. I can't even repent in my own strength, my flesh. I'm going to completely rely and do this by the Spirit. So that's how not to repent, how to repent. Number one. Number one, know that God loves you. If you are in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. You are loved. He, as he said to his son, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. He says that to every believer in Christ. You are my son. You are my daughter whom I love. With you I am well pleased. He can't. There's nothing you can do to get him to love you more. There's nothing you can do to get him to love you less. He loves you unconditionally. Now, in that love, he may discipline you. 
Okay, but that's but that's that's an act of love. He 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 loves you. God loves you. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to die as the sacrifice that forgives our sins. That's where it starts. Repentance starts with knowing that God loves you. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the basics. God loves you. Secondly, know your status. First of all, know your worth. What, what, what's this painting worth? Well, whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. You know, I painted it and it's a million bucks. And it's, oh, I'm not paying you a million bucks. I'll give you a hundred bucks. Well, I'm waiting for a million. You know, we wait a long time. Here's a hundred bucks. Yeah, okay. So that's what the painting's worth, what someone is willing to pay for it. Well, what are you worth? What am I worth? What God was willing to pay for us. And what was that? The precious blood, life of his son. We have eternal worth because he paid with, for us with the eternal love of his son. Next, know your identity. You know, what is our identity? Well, we are in Christ. And so whatever is true of Christ is now true of us. We are the righteousness of Christ. We, we are the, the, the followers of Christ. Uh, we are the sons and daughters of God. I mean, put it this way. Whatever is true of Christ is now true of us because we are in him. If so, if the father said at Jesus' baptism, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased, he says that to you and me as well. You are my son, you are my daughter, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Our identity is that, that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is who we are. It's amazing. And then calling, and I'm not talking about what job you're supposed to do, what calling God is calling you to, but, but your bigger calling is like, you're called to become like Jesus. You're called to grow in maturity, put, to put on the righteousness that he has won for you. You are called to put on the character of Christ, to become like Jesus. So first of all, know God's love. Secondly, know your status. Thirdly, know God's word. Do you know what God's word says about righteousness and about what he wants his children to be like? Listen again, John 8, 31 to 32. Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you will know who you will be my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you know the truth? Do you know the Bible? So we go back to the Old Testament law. He said, oh, but we're free from the law. Yeah, we're free from its curse. We're free as a means to be made right with God. We're free in trying to obey it through our own strength, but nevertheless, the Holy Spirit writes the law on our hearts and empowers us to do it. And so it still expresses who God is and, and, and the direction that our life is to go. So have no other gods before me. Do not make for yourself an idol, nor bow down to it or worship it. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember and keep the Sabbath day holy. Respect your father and mother. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit a murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Do not covet. And then Jesus, Mark 7, 20 through 23. So once again, do you know God's word? Jesus went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So there's a list of sins that we need to deal with. Uh, Paul, Galatians 5, 19-21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Once again, a list of, of stuff that God wants to deal with. There are other lists. In fact, um, in preparation for your coaching, uh, meeting with your freedom coach, you'll be reading other portions of scripture. And you're going to ask the Spirit to speak to you. Like, what do you need to deal with? So, first, know God's love. Know your status. Know God's word. 
and then know your true self. Some people never, ever slow down enough to examine their life. You know, the Bible is, is, is like a mirror. James says you, you, you look in the mirror to see yourself, but some people just can't remember. They, they don't look long enough and really deal with what they're seeing. And so sometimes you need to slow down. Now, this isn't navel gazing. This is looking into the word of God and letting it speak to you. Who am I? Spirit, show me. Who really am I? Help me to know myself. Now, that's all almost preparation, right? Know God's love. Know your status. Know God's word. Know your true self. That's all part of the repentance process. It begins with knowing. And then, five, you confess from your heart. Now that I know God's word and I know who I am, now I know what I need to deal with. I need to confess my lust. I need to confess my bitterness. I need to confess my selfishness. I need to confess my independence. I need to confess my lack of kingdom priorities. And I confess from the heart. I know it in my head, but now I confess from deep within me. That doesn't mean I'm always going to be emotional, but it's going to come from the core of who I am. I'm in touch with my true self, and I'm going to lay it before God and say, this is who I am. 2 Corinthians 7.10, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. But worldly sorrow brings death. So there's a certain kind of sorrow, confession that's right, where we say, you're right, God. And one is where, you know, it, it leaves regrets. It doesn't really, it, 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 it's just being emotional because we're caught or we feel bad about ourselves. But godly sorrows, we are truly sorry that we have broken God's law, that we've broken his heart, that we are not who he says we are, that we're not fulfilling, you know, the righteousness that God has given us in Christ. And it moves us to confess. So we confess from our heart. And then we decide to turn from sin and turn toward obedience. So there's the intellectual aspect. I know God's will. There's the heart aspect. I confess from my heart. And now there's the will, the volitional. I need to decide. I decide. No one else can do this for me, but I decide to turn from sin and turn toward obedience. This is where I do that U-turn. I'm going in this direction, and now I go in God's direction. And, and, and I could almost do six and seven on the same line. I rely on the Spirit. Uh, right? It's no longer just repenting in the flesh, in my own strength. I'm repenting through the power of the Holy Spirit. How to repent? The point of Christianity isn't maturing to the point of not needing God but maturing to the point of relying on him all the time, including in my repentance. I can't even do that apart from him. Look at Matthew 5, 3, the first of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt, who says, I have nothing to offer you except my need. I've tried to do it on my own. I've tried to, you know, live the life. I can't do it. I need you. It says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They get all the help they could ever want through heaven. John 5, 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You are bankrupt on your own once again. But through me, you can bear much fruit. I've used this many times, St. Augustine, without God, I can't. It is impossible but without me, he won't. Now, sometimes he doesn't end run around me and he helps me. But the point is, it, it's going to have to be the Holy Spirit helping me all the way. But I need to cooperate. I need to make that decision to turn from sin and to turn toward righteousness and God. 
And then I need to rely on the Holy Spirit doing that. Because, you know, there's a difference between sin and sins. Sin, like the big concept of sin, leads to sins. Independence is sin that leads to all other sins, whether it be cheating or lying or anger or murder. Self on the throne, self as God, self in charge is ultimately what we need to repent of. That's sin, me as God. I mean, ultimately, repentance isn't about changing your behavior, but changing your God. Sin is about idolatry. I'm serving myself. Repentance is about lordship. I am turning toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Will I bow before myself, God, or Jesus, the true God? God's one and only Son. So how do you repent? You confess from your heart. You decide to turn from sin and turn toward obedience. You make the decision. And through it all, you rely on the Spirit. Eight, you get accountability. You can't do it on your own. You've tried to do it on your own and it's not working. You need accountability. That is so biblical. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't do it on your own. Do it together. James 5.16, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So many people are not coming into community to deal with sin, and that's why they're not finding freedom. So you got to get accountability, and then you need to fall forward. Unfortunately, possibly, you might fall again in the same sin that you're repenting of. So how do you fall forward? How do you fall forward? You go back to number one. The first thing you do is you remember that God loves you, that God loves you. Secondly, you remember your status, your identity, your worth, your calling. You, you, you reflect on God's word. You reflect on your true self. Well, <laughs> I got a ways to go. I see it again. You confess from your heart. You decide to turn from sin and turn toward obedience. You rely on the Holy Spirit and you get accountability all over again. In other words, you fall toward the Father. You run toward the Father. I love the prodigal son. I love that picture of the son kind of coming home with his head bowed down, wondering if the Father's going to love him and accept him. And the Father runs, runs and embraces him. You fall forward. Remember, grace is the active ingredient in the life of the believer. You don't just start the Christian life by grace, through faith. You live the whole Christian life by grace, through faith. Your initial repentance is by grace, through faith. But every repentance along the way is by grace, through faith. In other words, it's by God's grace, His active love, presence, and help in your life. So, here's my big sin. And I've been reflecting on this as I've prepared this. My, my big sin is independence. And so my New Year's resolution is this, to learn to live by the Spirit and not the flesh. I, I realized, preparing this, I do so much in my own strength. And, and I don't rely on the Spirit. No wonder I'm struggling. And so my goal is to mature into a totally dependent life. True Christian maturity isn't not needing God. True Christian maturity is realizing I can, I need him all the time. So that's what I'm dealing with. Just some self-disclosure there. And finally, let's talk about prevention. Uh, as they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Here's something uh, I've kind of developed, stumbled into helping the guys at the Conquer Group deal with uh, their struggle with pornography. In the Conquer Group, we have this faster scale. And it's kind of the scale that you know that, whoa, you better slow down because you're getting closer. And it's an acronym and faster starts with you forget your priorities. And it goes from there and this is acronym. And I'm not going to get into the details. But with, with the guys have developed this so once you're getting faster, what do you need to do? You need to slow down. 
Do you know what it's like to speed up into that sin, whether it's anger or rage or gossip or lust? You just feel yourself speeding toward it. When you feel yourself speeding toward it, you need to slow down. And here's the acronym. Stop. (laughs) Just stop. Just stop what you're doing. Don't take another step. Stop. Then love. First of all, remember that you're loved. You know, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Sent his son to die as the sacrifice that forgives our sins. So remember that you're loved. Love him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, you know, love your spouse. Love your kids. Love the person who's in front of you. Love. Then obey. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. So you obey. And then you start walking, not in your own strength, but by the Holy Spirit. And so you keep this acronym, this this little thing. So when you feel yourself speeding up, you say, slow down. And, and sometimes I'll say it out loud, stop. i got to stop right now. Love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to love. Obey. Love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Okay. And then walk by the Spirit. I'm going to keep it step with the Spirit. And, and I can tell you, it really, really helps. Well, next I just want to uh, land this thing talking about the repent questions. Uh, those are online under grow. You will see freedom materials and you'll see the repent coaching questions. And before your meeting, it says in preparation for your meeting, prayerfully read through the following passage. As you read through them, any other passages, the spirit may lead you to ask the Spirit what sin He is calling you to repent of. And so this is where we're going to start dealing with that one sin. And you're going to have a freedom coach who's going to walk alongside this. Now remember, they're, they're a player coach. They're just like you. But they're going to ask, okay, what do we need to deal with? And you can see those questions just like we had with Get Started. But you can see those questions. You can have those in front of you. But there's some preparation first where you read the passages and ask the Spirit to speak to you. And our next class is uh, forgive. Forgive. And uh, so this is repent. And next next time we meet is forgive. And I'm just going to close out with a music vi- video that I love. And let this speak to you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was a lost, but now I'm found. Was the light, but now I see so clearly. Hallelujah, grace like a rain falls down. Let's go.
fades on the years, bright shining as the sun. I love that. <laughs> Let's pray. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the gift of righteousness. Lord, um, thank you that you're not done with us. Thank you that it's always by grace through faith. That, that, that repentance isn't a one-time thing. It's a, it's a lifelong thing and, until we get to glory that turning from sin and turning towards you. And thank you that, that we don't need to do it on our own, but we do it through your spirit, by your grace. Amazing grace. Lord, I, I pray for uh, everybody as they're going to be going into their freedom coaching sessions. And Lord, just make, take away their fear and Help them to realize the greatest thing in the world is repentance because on the other end is freedom, forgiveness, and your love. So thank you, Lord. Um, bless, bless the sessions now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>